Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Tuesday late afternoon. I hope you're finding this HUD conference to be illuminating. My name is Jeremy Newberg. I'm the CEO of Capital Access Incorporated. We are a HUD technical assistance provider. We've been doing that since 2000. Um, and we are a consulting and operations management firm in housing, community, and economic development. And with me is Grant Johnson, Director of Policy and Operations for Capital Access. Um, he heads up our Technical Assistance Division. Um, and it is our pleasure to be with you to talk with you about leveraging resources within the context of CDBG CB, the CARES Act funding, and specifically economic development programs. Some housekeeping. Um, the whole presentation and webinar is being recorded and it will be avail available on the HUD exchange on the uh, CDBG CV um, page within the HUD exchange. Uh, you all as participants are listen only. Um, we have closed captioning uh, using the show captions and you can consult the attendee guide for more information. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, and you'll see the Q&A feature um, so that you can do that. Um, we will try to answer every single one of your questions. Um, and, um, you know, look, you're taking time out of your day to learn something. You want to get some values. So ask the questions. And if we can't uh, answer it today, we commit to getting back to you to get you uh, a decent answer. Uh, when you submit your question, let us know who you are and where you're working, because if you work for a state or a county or a city, a rural, urban, it helps. It gives us a little context. Uh, one other thing to quick add on that is that the um, this presentation will be available um, through the uh, conference website under um, as an unedited recording on the on demand sessions a few hours after this session ends but it will not be posted to the HUD exchange for a few weeks. So you'll have to check in on the HUD exchange until it gets posted. Um, uh, that's true of the PowerPoint copy as well. So if you have any technical issues, request assistance through the chat box. There's an amazing crew of technicians and facilitators helping out. Um, and any specific questions that can't be resolved through the chat, just uh, do event support at side mgroup.com and away we go. Um, oh, even more about questions. Um, if you would like to access questions while simultaneously viewing the event, download the Slido app on your phone or go to sli.do on your web browser and then type in the code for the session. Um, the support team is posting the Slido code for this session in the chat. You can also scroll the bottom of the page to find Slido. Um, and what happens is the tech people take the questions you submit in Slido and then move them on to the Zoom app. And um, it worked pretty good yesterday. I'm confident it will, it will work well today. And away we go. Um, so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about leveraging resources. And this is also gonna be a refresher on um, what the federal notice with CDBG CV provides for economic development, um, because that provides the context. So we're gonna talk a lot about defining different types of leverage um, because there's financial leverage, but there's also um, capacity leverage. And we're going to go deep into, well, what do you want to do? And at what scale? And why do you need to leverage? What's, what's the purpose and how to align all that? So we're going to be looking at need, timing, capacity, and make a few recommendations along the way. Uh, we live in an unprecedented time where I've never seen so much money uh, from the federal government to address the COVID pandemic and the economic uh, impact resulting in it. I just read a summary of the American Rescue Plan um, State and Fiscal Local Recovery Fund 
uh, the final rule came out in early January, and it is remarkable how it aligns with the CDBG program. Um, so you really have an opportunity to be innovative and go big. Um, we're going to help you along the way. Okay, um, so today's objective is to help each grantee leverage the CDBG CV program with other funding sources in a thoughtful and strategic manner, specifically related to economic development programs. Um, and I'm gonna let Grant take it from here to talk about what is leverage. Thank you, Jeremy. So um, the basic definition of leverage is the non-matching cash or non-match in-kind resources uh, committed to making a proposed program or project fully operational. Um, it includes all the resources in excess of your project costs, as well as other resources um, that could be used on uh, delivery expenses that may not be eligible with your CDBG CV funds. So what does that really mean? Um, it means that you have project costs, and if you have gaps that aren't fully filled with your CDBG CV money, you and you need to fill additional gaps in the actual award or benefit, that's just layered financing. But if you are leveraging, it means that you are taking either resources for implementation, so capacity, uh, looking at other local government uh, agencies, state agencies, nonprofits to help you implement and launch and uh, operate your program. That's leverage of in-kind resources or providing um, non-matching cash uh, such as um, cash to grow the program. So if you're oversubscribed and you want to serve more than your grant award or allocation allows, then you can bring in private or public sources to expand on that. Um, there is some confusion about leverage as it relates to tax incentives and matching funds. Um, we'll get into a little bit later, but that's generally the, the definition of leverage. So think of leverage on three tiers, capacity and implementation, programmatic, can you leverage one program to serve another? Um, and then financial, do I, do I need to create incentives or match or other uh, sources to either complete the benefit or to expand the service area of the benefit. Next. So a couple examples. Um, one example of leverage would be using public service programs to assist with the increased participation or eligibility in the economic development project. So you may have some public services that say help small businesses get set up or put their uh, paperwork and documentation together for a loan application. So you can leverage that local nonprofit uh, uh, business and economic development center to support getting more applicants into your program. So that's an in-kind type of leverage. Requiring matching funds would be a way of growing, growing the pie, making the pie bigger, leveraging um, either state and local or private unrestricted funds into your program to serve a broader audience. Um, tax incentives can do the same. A revolving loan fund is an example of leverage. You are offering loans and taking the interest earned and repayment of those loans to make other loans. So uh, that's leverage within a program. And then you can have uh, coordinating capacity from other existing anchor institutions. So in the business and economic development world, uh, often you will leverage uh, community development financial institutions, usually those that manage new market tax credits and other types of programs where they may have loan processing or reporting or application capacity. So you're leveraging again, um, an existing anchor institution to implement your program. So a lot of different concepts of leverage here. So then what does it take to actually implement the leveraging of resources on a program? So um, the vision is just having a plan that articulates how you intend 
your leverage to you, what your program will produce and what outcomes it seeks to achieve. Um, and it's also then going to allow you to consider where there might be opportunities for leverage. The strategy is how you are going to use your different um, types of leverage in order to implement the program. So how will the program achieve the vision? Um, again, public facility infrastructure projects or remediation. So doing some early groundwork to support what it is that you hope to achieve. Um, transit systems are another classic example where you may be trying to drive more traffic into a retail or downtown district, but the um, uncertainty of safety of COVID precautions on your transit systems is preventing um, more folks from coming into the shopping areas. So maybe investing or leveraging some improvements to the transit system to make it safer and more accessible or more frequent is a leverage into supporting some of your business and economic development needs. And then you have partnerships, which is the in-kind type of leverage that we talked about. So who's going to implement the program at what stage and with what capacity? So all part of your overall vision, program design and strategy for implementing your program. And then who are the st stakeholders or um, main producers that are gonna be working with you to see it all the way through. So a couple of things to ask yourself. Um, why do you need leverage? Do you need leverage? Um, HUD is not requiring leverage. There's nothing in the notice that says you must leverage, but you will be um, asked to consider opportunities. Is there, is there something obvious that you should be leveraging? So you want to be making best efforts and you should document whether or not you considered leverage and why you were looking at opportunities for leverage, how they worked out or not. So something to keep in the project file notes. Um, who do you wanna serve? Is there an opportunity depending on who the beneficiary is? Is it a small particular segment of small business population? Is it um, developers creating uh, more economic development and business opportunities that are safer, more resilient? Um, you know, who is the beneficiary and where does, how does that help you define if there's an opportunity for leverage or a barrier to, to participate in the program where you can leverage other resources? And then with what type of assistance at what scale? So again, leverage is gonna take some coordination. It's gonna take some assessment. It's gonna um, maybe require programs to work together in parallel. So if you're gonna take on that level of complexity, um, even if it's seeking other financial institutions or sources, uh, you're gonna have a little more coordination to do. So if you're doing a very small scale program, leverage the time and effort for it may not be worthwhile. But if you're doing a large scale program, uh, leverage starts to provide some more dividends. And then of course, time is the huge element that really isn't as explicit in your rules and regs, but has a large impact on the effectiveness of your pro programs. So the timing of when you uh, provide these benefits and how and how long you're making them available and then how long it takes to actually get the benefits out on the street can have an impact. So leverage might be for uh, helping you expedite your program. So you just- know, Grant, Grant, this reminds me of uh, that wonderful quote, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, and, um, you know, we're certainly seeing this with our direct technical assistance work in upstate New York, where uh, a small business working capital grant program has had mu given much greater significance with the crisis, but it's led the grantees to think about, you know, how they run their small business assistance programs um, and understanding the role of a grant and then hopefully graduating to a loan with enough revenue uh, in the business. So a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And with the COVID crisis, we have an opportunity to take a fresh look at some of our legacy economic development programs. Um, and you know you're being successful if you're burning through your money and you need additional sources. Do that, thank you. So now we're gonna cover a few, I think, 
Next slide. A uh, couple other considerations around leverage before we get into some of the basics. Um, it's great for helping you meet your expenditure goals if there's multiple funders um, and you have a, a short deadline, which in this case, many of you do. So you can save some time and effort if you don't try and take it all on yourself, but you leverage the resources that are already on the ground or in your region. Um, so undertaking larger projects, as I said before, will result in an increased impact for your community. So if you can leverage additional resources, make the pie bigger, reach a broader audience, solve some problems, um, at a greater scale, you're gonna obviously have more impact. So that's another reason for considering leverage. But as we said before, if you start um, looking around and saying, okay, we were gonna do this program, we have this vision, uh, this is what we think's needed. You have to also consider what other programs are already also trying to address those needs. So you might have state programs or local programs that were quickly adopted and flexible, but maybe a little less clear. So are you gonna leverage or are you gonna compete with those? So be careful and be mindful of that. Um, complexity kills. So you don't wanna have too many steps, too many stakeholders, too many uh, application procedures or forms for beneficiaries to fill out. See, so the elegance is to keep the uh, program experience simple for the user. Typically in this case, it's gonna be the small business um, proprietor and or their employees. So you wanna keep those parts easy, even though there's already a lot of complexity in these programs, there's a lot of rules, a lot of documentation. So how can you leverage your resources to take care of that on the back end, but make the user experience very smooth and um, easy to, to take advantage of the benefit with? Uh, longer timeframes, uh, to complete projects. So if you're doing uh, a more involved business in, uh, space improvement and COVID resiliency repair type of program, well, then you're gonna have environmental review, you're gonna have property as assessments, you're gonna have things that go beyond just financial underwriting. So be aware of those. And if those are the extra steps in your program, again, consider leveraging in terms of how, how many stakeholders or partners do you need to take care of those different specialized steps versus are you bringing too many people to the table? So there's a balancing act to be mindful of here. Couple quick sources. So a lot of folks are always asking, well, what can I leverage? What are some, what are some other products? I, I don't have time to go out and research how many other business grants and loan products there are out there. Um, Google's a powerful tool these days. We didn't have it 20 years ago. Um, so what are the federal opportunities? Well, um, here are a few. We've listed a few for you that you can take a quick look at their website. So if you have a vision and a plan and a, a basic program design that you're considering, uh, definitely check these sources that we know exist to see if they are offering something that's comparable, easier, or something that you want to build on and leverage. So it may be that your sources of CDBGCV are the source of leverage for an existing program and the ability to grow it. So if a state has a really oversubscribed and successful uh, business and economic development loan, it may be that you want to target all of your money to uh, low and moderate income benefits and jobs. And so you can grow or build on that program with your source of funds. Um, so treasury is one source. That's where we have the American Rescue Plan funds. You have commerce departments, both at the federal and state level that are often managing business and economic development grants and loans. You have the Small Business Administration, SBA. Uh, they may have some loan products out there that you need to be mindful of uh, and or replicate so that people aren't getting confused about rules. Um, you have obviously your own CDBG entitlement programs in addition to the CDBG CV sources. So CDBG entitlement, um, you can leverage that to, to implement your programs or vice versa. You may have a very successful CDBG entitlement 
um, small business assistance program that you want to leverage your CV funds into growing or broadening. Um, Section 108, uh, or um, I think we meant 108 lending here, but Section 108 uh, are definitely uh, programs to look at. New market tax credits, both for housing and economic development. So uh, new market tax credits really support the commercial aspect. It's different than multifamily housing tax credits. So in the economic development world, that's the type of tax credit that we're typically looking at. Um, opportunity zones, there will have a few slides at the end that just speak to the leverage of opportunity zones and the types of financing and preferred financing terms that go in with those targeted neighborhood areas. And then um, Department of Labor and, you know, in terms of creating job opportunities or job resources, um, other, other agencies and divisions, everyone's working together to try and come up with from their perspective, how they can address the COVID needs and issues. Always state, local and private. So I would look at your uh, CDFIs, community development finance institutions, financial institutions. They're often acting as like a nonprofit lender. Um, and then of course your state and local uh, business and economic development uh, institutions. And so those are just a few. <laughs> yeah, that, and that was the whole challenge in putting this presentation together. But as you look at this, I would encourage you to say, uh, don't be manic on the, there we go. I would encourage you, I was like highlighting it and then it moved it. <laughs> Treasury, the American Rescue Plan is a direct grant going to a county or city um, based on population and other factors within the American Rescue Plan. And the state and local fiscal relief program is $350 billion. Um, and that is money that based on the final rule, it is absolutely remarkable how much um, it aligns with um, the objectives of the CDBG program in terms of public and behavioral health and um, serving uh, impacted and dispor disproportionately impacted areas. Um, and when it comes to impacted and disproportionately impacted areas, that's basically the essence of CDBG in terms of um, low income uh, census tracts and or populations. Um, but the treasury money is um, block, it's essentially granted directly to the unit of local government. Economic Development Administration, you have to apply. SBA is a loan for each business. USDA, you have to apply. CDBG, of course, is a block grant. Section 108 loan, you have to apply for the guarantee authority to do the deal. We had a lot of success with St. Louis County where we married CDBG subsidy with the 108 loan and the deal made much better financial sense. You might wanna think about that if you wanna do large scale COVID resiliency improvements of community or public facilities or business facilities, really large scale. And of course, new market tax credits, it's competitive with a community development entity that has an allocation of credits. Opportunity Zones is all about the census tract where it is eligible. And the Department of Labor has some remarkable grants as it relates to workforce development. So think about what do you have control over and what do you need to apply for? Because time is money. All right, here we go. Now, you may say, Jeremy, Grant, why are you going over the economic development waivers and alternative requirements in a leveraging resources um, presentation? Because HUD put a lot of amazing thought into this to give you all flexibilities. And with a clear understanding of the flexibilities, you can be innovative and, and creative. Um, so it's all in the Federal Register Notice, which is on the, the HUD exchange. And these are the foundations um, for the appropriations. Um, and in a nutshell, you follow the CDBG regulations uh, to implement your activities. Um, and unless uh, there's a waiver in the Federal Notice. So we're going to go over a few of those waivers just so you're all crystal clear. Of course, with CDBG, 70% of a grantee's total allocation 
must be expended for activities that benefit low and moderate income persons. You may be in a, can, in a county that wants to do a countywide small business assistance program, um, but you just don't have enough low mod census tracts. Well, then you might want to use other funding sources such as um, you know, American Rescue Plan, but for those low mod census tracts, you could use CDBGCV for a small business uh, working capital assistance program. And also remember that the overall benefit is tracked separately from um, the regular CDBG entitlement programs. Um, now, national objectives are really important. And you'll see what we do here is with each big item in the federal register related to economic development, we try to give you the section um, the title and the page in the Federal Register Notice so that you can look it up yourself. Economic development activities are typically qualified under low mod jobs, low mod areas, low mod clientele, and urgent need. Um, and the key to ensure that the overall benefit is met is that you prioritize low mod area, low mod job, or low mod clientele before urgent need. We are approaching the two year anniversary of COVID. If you're going under urgent need, you need to be crystal clear because HUD has given specific guidance on questions that you need to be able to answer related to urgent need. That if you don't, um, you're, you're running a risk. Um, and do your very, very best to do low mod area, low mod job, low mod clientele. And at this point, if you wanna do urgent need, I would really confer with your community planning and development representative uh, with HUD. Now- hey, Jeremy, we have one um, quick question about the presentation and whether the audience, it's designed for an audience of cities and counties or is it relevant for nonprofits? And I would say both but the primary audience here is um, grantees. So it would be um, state and local governments that are receiving CDBG CV funds to implement in their communities. But I would also say that uh, if you're a nonprofit viewer that uh, participates in business and economic development activities in your, in your region, that understanding these needs, these rules is really critical so that you can have an informed conversation with your uh, local government or, or uh, folks that you're working with in state and local government so that you can provide your capacity and your resources as leverage to their programs. Yeah, um, cross-pollinate. I, I, I think you're spot on, Grant. If you're a nonprofit and you wanna work in economic development for either the population or places that you serve, well, this presentation is gonna help you understand what your CDBG CV program manager must manage in terms of the compliance filter and the program design opportunity. Um, so I just think it provides you really good context um, to understand the variables. Um, thank you, Grant. Um, okay, so, a low mod area benefits all the residents of a low mod area, low mod jobs, uh, benefit communities by creating or retaining jobs, limited clientele, benefit low mod income individuals, which may be determined um, by several methods. Um, and let's start with the jobs. So this applies to activities that involve the employment of persons, the majority of whom are low moderate in individuals. And it's employment, it's not an independent contractor. We're, we're talking an employee where you're gonna do an, a W-2 for them. You're gonna do payroll taxes. It's an employee, not an independent contractor. Creates or retains permanent jobs, at least 51% of which are full-time basis, uh, are either held by a low mod person or considered to be available to low mod income persons. Um, it does not specify the total number of jobs that must be created or retained, uh, only that 51% must be available to low mod per persons. 
Um, and the total number of jobs that must be created or retained depends on the public benefit standards, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and this is a separate requirement from low mod jobs. The public benefit standard relates to special economic development where public subsidy is going to a business. And in order to avoid undue enrichment and just crystal clarity that the activity funded by CDBG um, benefits either a low mod income population or a low mod uh, area or clientele, the public benefits specifies um, how that will be done. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so here's what's really cool. Um, when um, documenting the presumption of low mod benefit, when documenting low mod income jobs, grantee may presume a person is low mod income if the census tract where they live or where they assisted the business um, and job is located has a poverty rate of at least 20% and there's evidence of pervasive poverty and general distress. So that gives you some flexibility. There's another flexibility with low mod jobs, um, which is wonderful um, in the income documentation. Before this, um, this alternative requirement came into place or flexibility, grantees had to take each worker and income certify the entire household of the worker. And that's a heavy lift. Now, grantees can consider individuals that apply for or hold a job to be a household of one for the purpose of meeting the income eligibility rather than considering the individual's total family size and income. And what happens is grantees can now substitute um, the annual wages or the salary of the job, you know, basically if say 80% of median for an individual is 36,000 and the job pays 32,000 a year, then it is below the 80% of AMI threshold. That's a big innovation. So now income documentation for meeting a low mod income job is based on what are the wages and or salary of the job for a single household of one, rather than doing an income certification for the household of the worker. Um, and you gotta give credit to the CDBG disaster recovery program, which began this and then it was picked up with CV and it's a wonderful innovation, really helping people. And then there's urgent need. Um, and so with urgent need, here are your questions and you better be able to answer them uh, with clarity. So is the activity designed to alleviate existing conditions? Um, and can you show how the urgent need activities prevent, prepare for, and or respond uh, to the virus? Does the condition pose a serious and immediate threat to the health or welfare of the community? Um, that is of recent origin or that recently became urgent. Um, so you can look at the Health and Human Services Declaration, Federal Disaster Declaration, state local declarations. Is the grantee or the uh, unit of local government unable to finance the activity on its own? And are other sources of funds not available to carry out this activity. So this is the old but for um, HUD subsidy, in this case, CDBG CV. So again, the activities must prevent, prepare for, and or respond to the virus. So you gotta be clear on how this is an urgent need. Um, and uh, these questions show that HUD's pretty serious about this. Okay, so now we move into underwriting. And um, underwriting, Criteria for special economic development activities must be developed and utilized consistently in the evaluation of projects. Um, and so HUD wants you to show how the activities prepare, prevent, um, and or respond to the coronavirus. Um, project costs are eligible, reasonable, clearly identified, and committed. The project is financially feasible. The return on the owner equity investment will not be unreasonably high. Um, 
and CDBG funds are dispersed on a pro rata basis with other finances provided to the project and not being substituted with non-federal support. These are very broad principles and you as a grantee have a fair amount of flexibility in fleshing it out. Um, so the tie back to COVID is irrefutable. That is just what CV is about. Um, but project costs eligible, um, now costs reasonable is evolving because we've had such a spike, say in construction costs and supply chain. So some flexibility and context is helpful. And then is the project financially feasible? You know, you don't want to give money to a business that's, you know, so over its head in debt that it might not be viable as a going concern. You know, the idea is that you're supporting businesses that provide goods and services for low moderate income areas and gainful employment for people. Um, so what I'm saying is you start with this underwriting criteria and then go deeper based on your local community conditions. Jeremy, we have another question here that I think is relevant to address now uh, because we're talking about leverage and underwriting. So the question was, um, how do you leverage other federal sources without creating a duplication of benefits? Uh, and while we do address that in a later slide, I wanna say for this purposes of underwriting, um, there's what's known as layered financing. So filling the gap of costs, right? So if you have a small business that needs $100,000 and you're only offering a $50,000 loan, it could be that to satisfy the remaining needs, another source is needed to fulfill that other $50,000. So that is filling the gap that is layered financing if you marry two sources together to fulfill the full need of a project or a business. Um, versus duplicating. If you're offering the same funds for the same activity or cost, that would be duplication. So we wanna be careful with some of these programs that we're not confusing layered or multiple resources to fulfill a full need uh, as duplicative because while they, you might use two federal funding sources to pay for the same type of need, it's just not paying for the same expense or the need twice. I hope that's clear. And we have a slide and, that we'll present later that also addresses this. For you. And we, we can definitely go deeper on duplication of benefits. Um, the other thing with duplication of benefits in economic development is, let's say a small business got a PPP loan in 2020 for 40,000 and it was for working capital and payroll needs in 2020, and they spent all the money. And then they got a PPP loan, PPP2 in 2021, and um, that was for four months of payroll and working capital. And now they need another grant of say $20,000 uh, in 2022 in order to retain or expand staff. Um, are is the PPP one and PPP two a duplication of benefits? No. Grant says no, everyone. Pray tell, Grant. So the big consideration with duplication of benefits for COVID, which is a little bit different than duplication of benefits for um, disaster recovery in a typical natural disaster situation, such as a flood or a hurricane, tornado, is that we are still in the disaster. And so time is everything in terms of measuring the time of need and whether or not the program satisfied a need at a point in time or is still available as a resource to somebody. So if somebody didn't use all of their resources and still has access to them, then you would count them as duplicative or potentially duplicative until they use up what's left. But if they don't have any resources currently available to them, and they maybe were able to weather the first two uh, waves of uh, COVID spikes where businesses may have been forced to close down temporarily, or they had um, you know, employees and workers that uh, were out sick and caused some financial hardship or delays in that business, maybe they haven't experienced that until now. So those other sources are no longer available 
So you don't count them as duplicative. So time is a critical element here when looking at duplication of benefits. Whereas when you come to a neighborhood after a storm has hit, your, your point in time is kind of drawn in the sand, right? It's any time after the storm has basically created its damage and disruption. So this is a little bit different and that's why not everything is duplicative. Um, okay, the, the DOB questions are great. We're gonna come to a DOB section. Don't be shy to ask those, those questions. Another example would be an SBA loan or let's say a CDFI approaches you and says, you know, uh, love what you've done with these little ten, twenty thousand dollar working capital grants, but you know we're transitioning from emergency to recovery, and we have some businesses um, that were negatively impacted. They suffered disruption loss due to COVID, um, but they've got some new ideas um, to grow their business and would. You know, we're willing as a CDFI to provide 75,000 in a revolving line of credit. We want you to come in with 25,000 um, so that we can shield ourselves of risk for what looks to be a $100,000 project, just as a concept. That's leverage, okay? You know, the CDBG, 25,000 is leveraging 75,000 in, in debt but they are two separate sources because the total project is $100,000, okay? So you've got some flexibility and the key thing is clarity. What is the purpose of the funding and what is the time frame or the project context for which you're deploying the funds? All right, Grant, we have another question. I understand the concept of financial feasibility but we are losing businesses regularly because COVID impacts on the economy. Banks aren't going to serve businesses in disadvantaged communities that are even riskier due to COVID. So where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> Swim lanes. So I was gonna, I was just typing a response to that that we'll address that towards the end during the question section. It's a broader question about strategy and just overall program design for business and economic development that isn't so much about the topics of leverage that we're in the middle of right now, but it's a great question. So okay. if you hang in there, we'll address during the Q&A period later, because it's a broader discussion about just how to make a business and economic development program effective in today's situation now. Okay. Thank you, Grant. All right, let's keep going through the regulatory framework. Uh, we'll keep this moving. Um, so with CDBG, the aggregate public benefit standard is waived, incredible. And the individual standard um, for each activity is modified. You as a grantee, you have three options. Um, one is that you create or retain at least one full-time permanent job per 85,000 of CDBG CV funds invested. The standard for regular legacy fee CDBG is 50,000. So that's an extra 35,000. Um, and the second opportunity for the meeting the individual standard um, is that the activity provides goods and, and or services to residents of an area such that the number of low mod income persons residing in the area served by the assisted business amounts to at least one low mod person per 1700 of CDBG CV funds invested. And that's up from one per 1000. Um, and then finally, CDBG CV assistance was provided due to business disruption related to the coronavirus, in which case no monetary standard applies. That third one is big and it gives you a ton of flexibility, but you must, you must document specifically how the business that you seek to serve experienced disruption and loss due to coronavirus, and then consult with your HUD CPD reps so they understand crystal clear um, the context. Um, but this is an incredible flexibility. You just have to use it thoughtfully and, and document it with clarity. 
Now, just um, to contextualize this in terms of leverage, it's something to be aware of. It's something that often gets missed that is coming with the HUD um, program funds here. So if you are mixing funds together in a project, this is going to become something that you have to track and report on. If you're leveraging two programs to support one another, it may not. It will only be for the, this is a reporting requirement that's only for your HUD sources, which is kind of a clue or an indicator to another Q&A question that I said we will address later on. Thank you, Grant. Um, so the public benefit standards alone do not require the grantee to track the percentage of jobs that are made available to low mod income persons. That's required separately if the activity um, is qualified using the low mod job national objective. Okay. Um, opportunity zones, nonprofits, and financing mechanism. Assistance can be made through any financing mechanism, not just new market tax credits. So if you've got um, entrepreneurs that are doing projects within opportunity zones um, and they are requesting some CDBG funding, uh, it, it can coexist. Um, and uh, nonprofits may pass assistance through financing mechanisms to other entities for community economic development projects, uh, particularly opportunity zones. Jeremy, we have another question that's tied back to the earlier slides on um, meeting national objectives. One is we're experiencing the highest number of cases ever with the Omicron variant. Many restaurants and stores are extremely short staffed. Some are closing days due to the lack of staff. Would this new surge count as an urgent need as it is causing a new set of issues for businesses? And the short answer is yes, it could. But the more involved answer is you still have to look at how you are providing your program resources, how you've designed your program, and whether or not you, need, you can use the urgent need national objective or if you want to strategically target or limit the access to those sources to the highest need or the greatest need areas where there are um, underserved communities that really need the access and support more. So think about prioritization. You can be using both urgent need and low mod jobs concurrently. Um, but yes, urgent need uh, certainly has come back in as a new consideration with Omicron. Um, and then the other question is, how long does a job need to be retained to it to qualify? Actually, Grant, before we go to that next one, so this is a fascinating question, and it's a very important question about Omicron. Um, o Omicron may die down, um, but we have this persistent issue of um, labor shortages and how that impacts businesses. The question is, can you make a, an activity work under the low mod area or the low mod job or the low mod clientele national objective? If you can, that's your safer approach. Um, because, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take for you to prepare uh, the assistance. And what we know with COVID is that things evolve. So, yeah, this could be, could fit under urgent needs, certainly. Um, but the message is try to make it work under low mod job, given these flexibilities um, or under low mod area, if at all possible. Yeah, and you still have a certain set aside for low mod um, benefits. So you're still, it, it often is going to depend on how well you currently have spent your CDBG CV funds in achieving the low mod uh, objectives uh, with the percentage of your funds and whether or not you're um, underserving the overall grant need for low and moderate income benefits. So you can do grants instead of loans, for sure. That'll get some of the money out faster. Um, a leverage response would be you may be best served by using, by saving some of your local or state or even leveraged private resources for the immediate emergency assistance type of grants so that you can keep those businesses moving or help sustain them 
so that they can come into your CDBG CV funded programs that will help them with longer term recovery. Uh, we had a slide there that talked about timing in terms of um, whether this is an urgent need or a short term recovery versus a longer term recovery, which is where the HUD funds are, are really more focused. Um, we had the quick question also on the on the Q&A about the um, how long does a job need to be retained to qualify? Do we have the low mod jobs uh, reporting slide we could go back to, but I believe the answer is one year. Okay. And then is there an amount for a part-time job if you're providing funds for an incubator type of program? So. Um, Part-time jobs uh, won't count towards your full-time jobs, but uh, you got to satisfy your full-time job uh, requirement for if you're using the low mod jobs national objective. So it depends on what national objective you're using and what type of job outcomes you're reporting to. We got another question. Do you want to hit the question or move forward? Uh, well, I'm scanning them here, Jeremy, to see which ones we'll respond to at the end, but keep going, please. Okay. I'll interrupt you when it's appropriate. All right, no worries. Um, float funded activities grantees may not use CDBG funds for float funded activities. It's a pretty sophisticated uh, cash management mechanism. And during periods of economic distress, businesses may be better served with grants rather than amortizing or servicing loans or more complicated loan pools. You've got to assess what a business can do. Um, you know, what are you underwriting? Um, what are the revenues and expenses of the business? And in some situations, a grant just might be the better, um, within the context of a crisis and emergency, the better uh, vehicle. Um, here we go, section 108 loans. Um, so CV funds may not be factored into a grantee section 108 borrowing authority. What that means is the borrowing authority for a 108 loan program is based on the annual allocation of legacy CDBG, not CDBG CV funds. Um, but grantees can use CDBG funds to make a direct payment of principal interest or fees due under a section 108 note if the direct payments related to disruption and or loss due to coronavirus. So you could have put a lot of money into a new, um, you know, renovated um, hotel. And, you know, what happened to the hospitality travel and lodging industry with COVID was pretty devastating. And so this is an example where you can use CDBG funds um, to make uh, principal and interest and related fee payments on the 108 note, which is pretty remarkable. Um, then the grantee can use CDBG CV funds to supplement assistance to businesses where initially they were provided with 108 funds um, and uh, there's an, a need to prevent, prepare for, respond to the virus. Um, with that business, that is not considered a duplication. Um, it's supporting the business and it's a new need. Um, the documentation that the original assisted activity satisfies the national objective criteria and is sufficient to demonstrate that the use of the guaranteed loan funds and the additional CDBG CV assistance meets a CDBG national objective. That's a pretty wonderful flexibility um, to help keep 108 projects financially feasible. Grantees must document that all CDBG CV funded activities help prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Uh, note that activities must tie back to the virus, um, not necessarily the beneficiaries, it's the activities. So assistance, to a business that will hire persons who became unemployed during uh, 2020, 2021 due to the virus, even if the assisted business was not in operation at the time. Um, assistance to startup businesses or restart businesses closed since January, 2020 to offset other business closures uh, due to the economic effects of the virus. 
Um, duplication of benefits, here we go. Grantees must develop and maintain adequate procedures to prevent DOB that require at a minimum assessment of whether CDBG funds will duplicate financial assistance already received by the business for related unmet need and the period of performance. DOB and economic development during the crisis is all about the timing of the funds and what's the use of the funds. Any person or entity receiving CDBG CV assistance, including subrecipients um, and direct beneficiaries, must agree to repay assistance uh, determined to be duplicative. Um, and the best vehicle for that is a subrogation clause in the grant agreement. Subrogation, it's a good vocabulary word. Need considerations, here we go. What are the most pressing COVID related needs of your business um, community? Often it's working capital to help a business continue or improve so they do not close due to lost revenue from the shutdown orders, social distancing and other effects of the pandemic. Um, resources to attract, hire and retain workers. This has become a much bigger issue in 2022 um, it fomented in 2021, um, and HUD's done a lot to provide some guidance and pathways on how CDBG CV funds uh, can help with the labor shortage uh, issue, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, COVID resiliency improvements. We did a training session on that yesterday. It's the idea of physical improvements that facilitate better sanitation, uh, air circulation, social distancing, um, to be more resilient. And this can apply to a business facility. This can apply to a community or public facility. It can even apply to housing. Um, central corridor revitalization or other measures to bring goods and services back to low income communities. And we respect that it is a big country and there are needs that we might not have thought about. Potential CDBG economic development activities. Typically what you're gonna see is services such as marketing, outreach, recruitment, training, and then physical improvements, construction, rehab, acquisition, demo, fixed equipment, and then direct assistance to businesses. Could be working capital, uh, movable equipment. Um, and the, the direct assistance could also be physical improvements but these are very clear categories, you know, a services contract, a construction contract, or a direct assistance contract. Activities, expenses to address labor shortages. Um, so you could do new employee retention and or referral bonuses um, prorated over a period of at least six months. Um, you can fund services for recruitment. You can fund on-the-job training to enable employers to hire less skilled workers, uh, expanded childcare services, pre-apprenticeship programs or other employment training, personal protective equipment, remote work equipment. These are eligible CDBG CV activities that you can direct to address labor shortages. You have that flexibility. Um, more, um, make sure the tie back is that people are staying in their homes due to the fear of getting COVID or needing to care for children at home. So you're providing an intervention to address this problem. Many activities to address labor shortages will qualify under the Loma job national objective, which means at least 51% uh, of the jobs were created or retained um, and for uh, low moderate income wages. Um, the activities may qualify as low mod clientele if the business is a micro enterprise. A micro enterprise is when the owner earns a low moderate income below 80% of median, and there are five or fewer employees in the business. HUD provides this flexibility for a national objective um, and also relief under the public benefit standard. Uh, consider partnering with nonprofits providing childcare or employment training as public service activities. 
Um, and then the individual public benefit standards apply when you're directly assisting um, a business. Um, and we covered that. Um, if you're funding personal protective equipment or remote work, be mindful of the CDBG limitations on the purchase of equipment. Um, in general, if you're purchasing something of 5,000 or less, very often you can qualify that as a supply, supplies rather than uh, equipment. Um, and the key is when you're purchasing equipment, will it be affixed or mobile? Um, if it is affixed to a building, then you have um, a, a deeper environmental review requirement. Um, okay, here we go. Equipment considerations, tangible personal property, including informational technology with a useful life of more than one year and a per unit acquisition cost, which equals or exceeds the lesser of the capitalization level established by the grantee or subrecipient for financial purposes or 5,000. That's a long way of saying what I just said, um, but that's okay. Um, we're trying to demystify some regulations and give you good information. Um, anything that does not meet the above definition is considered supplies. Fixed equipment um, is defined as an integral fixture to an assisted structure is eligible. Um, movable equipment is generally ineligible, but may be authorized as part of a special economic development activity, such as a cart filled with PPE equipment. Leasing of movable, movable equipment is preferred. Purchase of movable equipment is subject to the requirements pertaining to acquisition um, that is part of 2 CFR Part 200.313. Matching the need. This Real is quick, Jeremy, before we get into the next slide, we had just a couple questions about the LOMA jobs. Um, one, uh, what is where is the, the the guidance on how long a, a full-time job uh, equivalent needs to be maintained? I had said, I believe it was one year. Um, it is in, uh, I believe, one of the CPD notices on the HUD website. Um, so you can check it there. Uh, I don't have that information readily available, but we can follow up in our written responses when the recorded version gets put out. Uh, the other question was, can two part-time jobs be put together to count as one full-time equivalent? And I, I'm pretty confident in saying no. Otherwise, we wouldn't be distinguishing between full-time equivalent and part-time jobs. But the idea of full-time equivalent jobs is that you're creating, hopefully, a job that creates some type of a, a sustainable income for a low, moderate household or individual. So, the idea is, is if you're only creating part-time jobs, it's not really enough to support long-term those individuals, they would need to get two. So just creating two part-time jobs to two separate individuals isn't achieving the longer-term outcomes that you would want. Hopefully that answers that clearly enough for you. Do laptops count as movable equipment? Um, all right, I'll let you take these um, questions. Yeah, that was just for the previous slide. Um, yes, laptops are considered movable equipment. So that's typically something that you have to lease. Um, and then really any computers, unless it's built in as a kind of operating piece uh, to a piece of equipment. So if it's really attached to a piece of permanent a fixture, then I'd say no, um, or if it was required in order to operate a permanent fixture, then you might get a special exception. Those are all areas where you're going to want to consult with your HUD rep uh, to make sure that you're clear before you presume you can move forward as, as it being permanent or non. Um, would routers, modems for broadband related activities be considered supplies or equipment? Um, if they are fixed and providing a benefit, I believe they are considered permanent fixtures because you need them in order to operate a lot of your equipment. And if you, it's wired into, the, into the, the room, it should be considered part of the fixture. Um, and above that, we had a question, can funds be used to provide better virtual tools to businesses 
such as web page, virtual, virtual applications to improve sales and marketing. Well, it, it, those are sales and marketing tools. So that's working capital. So it would be an eligible expense. Um, that's working capital all day long. Um, can CDBG CV be used before leverage funds and not create a duplication of benefit or should the leverage be used first and then CDBG utilized if there's a financing gap? Um, again, it's, it's the, with duplication of benefits, it's what's the overall project cost? Um, and, and then um, what is the timing and the use of the, the funding? So if you have a specific project that you're thinking about, um, you know, why don't you ask the question again uh, so that we have more of the context because you're hitting us with a, a hypothetical here. Um, the timing of when the money comes in um, is, is relevant, but we'll, we'll, we'll take that one a little bit later. So why don't you give us a little more information on the context and, and we'll hit it a little bit later. Um, okay. Uh, Grant, this is you. Yep. Um, and then just there was a question about the part-time versus full-time equivalent. Again, if you think you have a case to be made, um, HUD has really been working with folks to try and be as flexible in the interpretation of the regs and with your policy as possible so that these dollars can be spent and um, impact folks where and as needed. So if you have a kind of in the weeds question about how you want to um, consider uh, part-time jobs for full-time use, uh, advocate for it. But as far as my read is, I, I don't, I think the belief is, is that they're considering part-time versus full-time work um, in terms of how it's benefiting the low mod individual long-term. All right, so this is my slide here. Yes, it is. Okay. Matching the need to an appropriate leveraged source. So um, again, consider whether your funding source uh, is trying to leverage or is a match to fill gap. Um, and then are you, uh, is it appropriate for the type of service? So what's the time frame for expenditure? Um, how difficult is it to obtain the funding? How complex is the flow of funds? So these are all questions that you have to ask yourself in terms of your program design to consider where is leverage best versus where is just putting two sources together to meet a full need better programmed. Um, and not, of course, creating duplication of benefits. So you don't want to give somebody who has a need for $50,000 in new equipment, um, fixtures, or um, resources to continue to maintain or support the business in maintaining operations. Uh, you're not gonna give them $100,000 in resources if their needs only 50. That's where you run into the risk of duplication. If you want to leverage your CDBG CV funds so that you can serve more of those businesses because you're anticipating an overwhelming demand, it may be that you want to create a match, a local match requirement or a state match requirement, or there are other sources that you can bring in to expand that program. How you manage that on the grants management side is going to vary. So it could be that you're using half of one source to fund 50% of a grant and half of another source to fund the other 50. But generally what I see folks do is break it out. You know, so many grants are funded with your CDBG CV, and then your um, CD, your other sources will fund another cohort of those grants. So, it's just how you want to manage your your finances and what's easiest for you based on how you have your system set up. Um, what's the maximum award? Is it worth the effort to apply for and manage the funds? Um, so don't make your grants or loans too small that it's not really enough to help folks. Um, don't make them so large that they're going to create uh, risks for undue enrichment and create a whole bunch of extra reporting concerns that you need. So think about how you're sizing your loan and where leverage might be an opportunity to make your grant amount reasonable. Um, or loan amount reasonable. And then what's the compliance and monitoring burden? So again, a lot of these questions that we've been getting in the Q&A are, I think, starting to try and predict or pre-anticipate 
whether or not um, doing all of this financial underwriting, doing all of this reporting, all of this tracking of jobs is worth it. Um, and the message is these funds are very flexible. If you use your fund very simply and directly, that allows for speed. Um, if you want to leverage your funds to create a longer term, bigger, more sustainable recovery, you may be adding complexity and you may then be wanting to attract leverage where you can um, maybe leverage small short-term grants to support the business so that it has time to apply for and get through the underwriting and approval process for a larger loan or grant that you want to offer. And that's really what we've typically seen work best is that um, you know, leveraging a small short-term very flexible source of grant funds is usually a better front end in an emergency situation approach to then provide a larger longer term recovery loan or grant. Good. Yep. Okay, so we're gonna do timing considerations grant. Yep. So relief versus recovery, we spoke to this earlier. Um, yes, Omicron has created a new type of immediate need and urgency. Um, so a lot of the funds with CDBGCV are, were and can be used as a relief source, but you do have a lot of tracking and reporting and uh, you still have a certain level of underwriting for eligibility, even with grants. So you have to assess what kinds of infrastructure have you already built with your HUD programs? Or is this a new type of use of funds for you? Or do you have an entitlement um, business grant and loan program that you can just uh, grow? So that's gonna be one of the considerations for whether or not it makes sense for short-term uh, or long-term recovery in your program design. Uh, so you gotta look at uh, what types of sources you're leveraging and whether there's a conflict in the timing or a complement. Um, if you're trying to get somebody to apply for a loan that's $100,000 that's going to serve them for two to three years, um, and then you're offering a short-term fixed grant on the back end if they finish the loan, it may not be the right design because you're telling them to go through a lot of headache and heartache in terms of underwriting and uh, documentation and you're using a small grant as a carrot at the back end, it might not be enough because their need is now. So you may wanna invert that model. That's how you're gonna consider your leveraging opportunities. Um, is the relief temporary or permanent? So again, talking about maybe your assistance is really less focused on jobs and more focused on temporary relief uh, so that a business owner can kind of keep the lights on versus a permanent fix where you're gonna create some real sustainable long-term jobs. The businesses that are already closed, you're not gonna really be able to bring them back. So this is more of a permanent recovery type of situation. Um, and then it may be a, a frequent or more frequent, uh, smaller expenditure over a shorter time period, um, or you're going to, as we've discussed, uh, create programs that are really about long-term recovery. Um, you know, are you responding to COVID or are you preparing and preventing future COVID spikes? They can, Omicron's one, we talked about, it, it was just a concept back last fall. Now it happened, right? So as we were coming into November, December, we were talking about recovery and shifting to recovery. And I think in some cases now post holiday season, we're back into an immediate need situation where it's that second, third bite at the apple that's starting to take out a lot of small businesses. Maybe the PPP loan got them through the first year. Maybe they were able to retool, get the resources that they need, but now they can't find anybody to keep the store running. Um, and for all of the assistance you may give them, they still may not be able to do it. So maybe you have to focus on job creation or job protection. Um, there's a lot of strategies out there that are just being explored right now. Uh, activities such as working capital assistance, direct assistance, uh, programs that support, support workforce re-entry, definitely part of the relief strategy. 
uh, versus creating long-term uh, uh, solutions to gaps in the workforce. We've, we've had a, a loss of capacity in the construction trades. Uh, we've had, um, you know, in which case you're gonna be investing in workforce training. You don't marry those two types of programs typically um, in the same application, but one might leverage the other. So you may wanna take a two-pronged approach. One that helps small businesses get access to employees that are qualified and, and somewhat trained with some skills, and then also create a program that's going to fund workforce development that's gonna take a year to get people into a training system, get them trained, get them qualified, get them vetted, and then put them into a pool of available laborers that these businesses can consider. So, um, you know, we're talking about relief versus recovery here, that timing matters in your program design. So structure your grants and loans accordingly. Okay. The problem for us is we're in both. So you may need to develop more right. programs. Right. It, it, this is such an uneven, that's why we say COVID is evolving rather than resolving and certain areas in the country are impacted more acutely than others. Um, so you may be in crisis mode again, or you may be in recovery mode. Um, and again, this is a national audience. So, you know, our, your strategies may change in different parts of the country, depending on what's being experienced there. If you recall, in the very early days, we saw this big spike of um, infection occurring on the two coasts and moving in towards the center of the country. Uh, now it's shifted around in different patterns. So depending on where your, uh, your jurisdiction is, um, you're gonna want to be mindful of that and take um, different strategies. I'd say the best strategy is to have a short-term and a learn long-term solution. So it may be best to split your sources and create two types of, of um, programs so that each can operate depending on how COVID and this pandemic has shifted. Which financing mechanisms right for your program? So um, I think we've talked a lot about this already. Uh, we'll just quickly summarize some of the pros and cons. So um, amortizing uh, servicing loans uh, are a bigger lift. So it's more of an investment in your infrastructure and delivery model. It can be a little more burdensome for the business to get through, but then you may want to increase the amount of that uh, amortizing servicing loan so that it's attractive. I mean, rates are still at a historic low. They're starting or will be starting uh, most likely to start to creep up a little. So um, for the, the recent past, I'd say it's been hard to offer uh, a low interest rate product because there are so many there. But just note that in the business and economic development world, as opposed to the housing and building world, um, you know, getting a small business economic development lo loan right now through a traditional bank is still probably going to be closer up into the six, seven or greater percentage uh, because there's more risk. So you may still be competitive with a three to 4% loan um, to a traditional banks. So you're going to have to look at what the traditional banks are offering. Uh, if you just offer the same, why would somebody come to you than, than a traditional bank? Um, you're going to do, you could do forgivable loans so that you have a little more flexibility. So you say, uh, the concept here, it's a grant, it's uh, a loan until it's a grant. So you have to treat everything that you're doing with a forgivable loan as a loan until you have forgiven it. So if you have certain criteria that need to be met, or needs that need to continue in order to make it forgivable so that you can adjust and meet the businesses and the owners where they are, then um, you know, you've, you've got to think about what it is that you're doing from a loan processing perspective. So there's more administrative burden. There are some uh, consequences of default because you're kind of telling them it could be a grant, but they have to behave like it's a loan. So there's a little more risk there in mismessaging or uh, folks not following the rules the full time. And then um, 
you know, business owners might be suspect of that. They, they've already gone through a lot of hardships. So having a lien uh, against their credit or against their property could be problematic for them. You're gonna have to assess these things and size it accordingly. All right. Wonderful. Okay. And so then, um, you know, in terms of the timing factors on your leverage, one of the things that I've seen with leveraging other resources is people, again, time is a really important element that the regs don't necessarily speak to, but your program design and your operations need to take into consideration. So, um, you know, if the source of funds that are leveraging participation in your program are not under your control, might they go away by the time you launch your program with the leverage resource? Is that resource still likely to be around? That would be a bummer. <laughs> so you really got to look at the timing and availability uh, and make sure that you're trying to work in parallel. Uh, again, if we're doing a different approach where we're trying to leverage a short-term grant program, you better make sure that your loan application is available while people are still getting those grants and that you're not rolling out a loan application that was supposed to leverage a grant six months after the grant runs out. So these are the types of timing delays and considerations that you have to really take another look at when looking to leverage resources or capacity even. Um, if you are gonna presume that you're gonna launch a loan product or a grant product next month, and you're going to use a local nonprofit or CDFI to manage the intake process. Uh, how many steps and what types of documentation do you have to have lined up to actually hire them, have them procured or directly contracted to implement that? And is their staff ready? So don't presume that because you're leveraging other resources, they can quickly pivot and provide that service right away just because they have that capacity you've got to work out a contract. They're not going to work on good faith for six months if that's how long it's going to take you. So get in front of those time gaps and issues um, before you launch your program or all good intentions go to waste. Um, if you're behind on expending the funds that you have and leveraging additional funds may end up just complicating it. So again, we did talk about uh, complexity and with leverage, you are adding some complexity. So if you're in a long-term sustainable, um, more sustainable, more long-term type of program design, then you have some patient capital. Then you have some, some ability to bring in a little extra complexity to make it even more favorable. But if you're in an immediate urgent need situation, leverage might have to go out the window for the short term. You may just have to do short term, small grants to help people get through the crisis. So be mindful of time. And if you're considering COVID resiliency improvements, say to business facilities, let's say it's a corner store that's just got, you know, terrible airflow, terrible HVAC, and it has knob and tube wiring, oh my God which is a huge uh, hazard. Oh, and there's um, you know, a hole in the roof. Um, you may want to blend the CDBG funds uh, for CV specifically for the COVID resilience improvements. And then if there are other uh, code related or energy efficiency improvements, you could blend it with the um, legacy CDBG funds uh, to improve the facility. Uh, for the community. And just, right. just to illustrate this in one more way, you know, one of the things that we saw a lot of restaurants, because a lot of people are very focused on restaurants and food businesses, they've taken a real, they, they've really been beaten up by this. It's already a hard business uh, to run. Um, and yet they are a pretty significant piece of uh, a lot of folks, uh, downtown revitalization efforts and economies. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to put together a grant or loan that's going to support restaurants in, build, in building more outdoor seating capacity, have you considered all of the zoning and permitting requirements if part of your strategy is to have them build that in the parking lanes or 
um, side parking lots? Are there access to land use? That would be a perfect capacity leverage opportunity. Work with your streets or code enforcement department to make sure that they have the staffing and the power or can you provide them some resources to grow the staff and power to provide those exceptions or change legislation and zoning so that these restaurants can quickly actually realize your grant product to build those facilities outdoors. All right, so that's another classic example of that timing and coordination with leverage. So let's talk a little bit about the Section 108 loan. The Section 108 loan is really uh, financing uh, its CDBG funds as a loan um, uh, because it's a loan guarantee and it's a way to leverage the CDBG allocation. Uh, and the idea is to take on high impact economic development, housing, public facility infrastructure projects. So when you do a 108 loan, <clears throat> you got to do the full CDBG underwriting and compliance uh, review. Um, so, and um, you, you, it, it's the same exercise of underwriting and compliance. Um, and the benefit of a 108 loan is the interest rate is relatively low. You have profound flexibility on repayment terms. Um, you can go interest only, you can go within a, a fixed interest rate um, and um, administration may count as an activity delivery cost. And um, HUD's done a lot of work to make HUD 108 coexist very well with the new market tax credit program. Uh, I worked on a deal with HUD 108 financing CDBG subsidy and new market tax credits uh, to do a public facility um, that had also um, leasing out space to what I call community commercial real estate. Um, so these may apply within the context of the tie back to COVID. Timing, section 108 loan guarantees are a good source of leverage uh, to achieve a greater impact. They do take time. You have to apply to HUD to get the guarantee or, or the borrowing authority. Uh, they want you to come up with a plan. And what are you going to do with the HUD 108 money? Um, and um, there are often you have to market an outreach. Um, uh, you could have a site assembly and capital stack assembly issue. You have application underwriting um, and then still HUD. Uh, financial management and headquarters in the field office have to review and approve. Um, but these are typically for bigger projects, um, higher impact. Um, and you, you know, whenever you have multiple funding sources, you always have a coordination and timing. And uh, that's also with closing and the loan documents. So HUD provides a lot of technical assistance with the 108 program. Um, there's a whole new generation of staff with 108 and they're eager to work with grantees. Um, so what can you do to expedite a HUD 108 project? Um, it, it could be good if you already have the borrowing authority, without a doubt. Um, you already have a specific project and it meets a national objective and you've got tie back, tie back yay, go for it. Um, you've identified reliable sources of repayment with HUD 108, um, HUD really wants to see the project generate the revenue to pay the loan. In certain situations, you can use CDBG funds to pay the loan. Um, it is not encouraged based on feasibility. Um, and of course, the project has broad support. Um, there's already site control and there are no uh, complicated site issues that will um, result in problems with environmental review and all the funding sources are committed. Um, you know, that's typically the threshold to say uh, whether or not this makes sense. All right, capacity, you ready Grant? Yes, and I just um, also wanted to say that uh, we did take a few minutes there to just clarify a few points on the full-time job equivalents. So um, I was saying how I don't believe that the part-time jobs, two part-time jobs counts as one, if the part-time job is a full half-time, 
because you're counting hours. So if a full-time equivalent is 35 hours and your part-time is truly half of the 35 hours, both and both part-time jobs are, yes. If your part-time job is 10, 15 hours a week and not even achieving 30 hours, those two part-times don't make a full-time equivalent. So it, again, it's subjective, it depends. It's gonna depend on how your program's designed and what types of jobs you're supporting and creating. Um, so why is it important to think about capacity? Leveraging multiple funds and sources can be complex, as we've said. It can take a little extra time um, and with lots of moving parts. So among other things, you're gonna to need to make sure that you have the people and the systems in place to handle it. So uh, I think we've hit this home before, but again, just to hit it home again, uh, these are a few things to look at in terms of assessing your capacity to do leveraging. So is there a program or a project uh, developer and management uh, capacity? Uh, who's gonna manage the day-to-day -day coordination? Is this something that's going to be um, taken on by in-house staff or is this something that you can outsource of, or have already outsourced with nonprofits or local vendors and uh, providers, contractors? Um, your marketing and outreach, you're gonna need to create time because just putting a loan product out on the street doesn't mean that they're going to come running to you. You've got to make sure that people see this on their radar. They're looking at lots of information right now and scrambling to find it. You have to make sure that if you're offering something, it can be found clearly and that you've got, you've put a little extra resources into it. If you need to um, pause, put together a kind of marketing package to sell your product uh, as something that's better or uh, you know, accessible to a limited clientele, it may be uh, that you really need to um, consider the, the timing of that before you start to leverage a whole bunch of participants. Again, as I talked about the contracting, the capacity that your program design is uh, depending on, you have, to, you have to test those assumptions and you have to really look at a timeline. So you gotta chart this out. Um, if you're going to do something innovative or creative that you haven't done before, there could be other uh, legal requirements or reporting requirements. So again, one of the first things to do is if you're going to join two resources, one, make sure that they're not duplicating each other, that they each have their swim lane or their way in which they're funding the overall need. And then from there, you're going to need to create some documentation that will assure one is supporting the other in the way that it needs to. So uh, just a lot of program design uh, considerations here. How are you tracking and reporting on two sources of funds versus one? Does that add complexity? Is there anything that you need to build into your monitoring system to track that? Because they may both have different types of reporting requirements. Um, so just a, a series of things to consider. We have 30 minutes left, I think, I think we're pretty good on time. Um, but I think we're, we're okay. Yeah, and I just wanted to, um, we had one section 108 uh, question, uh, which was confirming how the borrowing uh, authority is calculated. And basically if a grantee gets a million a year in CDBG, what HUD does is they divide that by 20%. And that would be 5 million. And in the question, it was the CDB allocation times five. Um, uh, two, two paths get you to the same destination. The theory, the principle is, if the grantee has to pay back a loan, that no more than 20% of the CDB allocation, if they're paying it from CDBG, would go to servicing the debt on the CDBG loan. I believe that's the correct approach. Uh, what is the role of the grantee? Grant, you want to do this? Sure. Yeah, I mean, again, um, it's just thinking about swim lanes. I, I'm always a big fan of process maps when you're trying to design a program. Uh, a process map is going to be a very helpful tool for you so that you can show what the interdependencies across leveraged programs are and what the role of each stakeholder is. If it's a grantee at the state level working with a county subrecipient, um, it's one model. If it's a direct entitlement running something with a few contractors, vendors, or nonprofits, 
it's another, but I still think it's a really important tool. It'll help you with your timing alignment. It'll help you with your resource alignment. It'll help you with your existing capacity and timing abilities. So, um, you know, be clear about who who's doing what, when, with what, which resources and what documentation. So that's where your policy and procedures comes in. I find a process map really helpful for outlining what I need in my policy and procedures. Um, you know, then don't let the cross-cutting regulations catch you un, unawares. So there's a lot to learn about the HUD rules, but then there's other uh, considerations if you're doing things like acquisition or construction, um, then you start to run into some of the cross-cutting regulations, environmental review for one example. Um, so if you're not doing just a financial product, but you're gonna do physical improvements, then you gotta take that into consideration. Um, and make sure that all the parties that are going to be processing those documents are queued up and ready and prepared to serve your program. Because again, we have lots of programs running out there with lots of different subsidy sources. Everybody's starting to feel a little overextended. So you want to make sure that if you're going to keep adding more to pivot and address the, the current needs at hand, that you actually have the capacity on the ground um, to do it. Um, everything on all the way on through uh, grants, grants reporting and, and monitoring. Uh, so who's at the table and who needs to be? Well, you've got the grantee staff, obviously they need to be involved because they're gonna be the ones uh, approving this. So if you're a state that's always gonna be sub using a subrecipient model, don't just think that you can award grants to subrecipients and expect them to capture all of the reporting. It's really, it's really important for states using a subrecipient model to consider the monitoring and make monitoring a regular thing, but not a gotcha thing, make it a collaborative thing. Uh, make it so that you are working with your county to ensure that they're hitting their goals and that if the state can step up and help um, advocate or do things with the program design to make it go faster, that's part of the monitoring strategy. It's not just an audit to say, hey, you didn't do this right. Um, if there's other departments, like we were just talking about environmental reviews, you got to get your SHPO, which is usually at the state level, uh, authority on board. So if you're going to be doing all kinds of physical improvements and it needs to go through historic preservation, are they overall already overwhelmed? Can you leverage some of your admin or uh, dollars to support them taking on a, a part-time person to do the special reviews for your program if you're going to generate any serious volume? Is that worth the effort? Um, so just make sure that you're also leveraging from the opposite direction. There's a lot of good nonprofit and local programs that can really get the dollars out fast because they've already got models for public facility services, different types of economic development loans that are all leveraging one another. Support those programs, sustain those programs, grow those programs. Don't just say it's enough. So, um, you know, those are also considerations to take in. in. Um, and then don't forget that there's the private sector out there and they are hungry to work on this. They need this work as much as um, the businesses need the loans and the grants. So if there are delivery models for servicing loans, underwriting grants, doing application intakes, if your nonprofits are already overwhelmed or you don't have much nonprofit capacity in your immediate region, uh, there's a lot of national providers that do this. Um, the big ones are going to follow the bigger jobs. So you might have to do a little bit more on your procurement side to find them. But there's, there's a lot of businesses that really want to participate in supporting these programs to support economic development. Thank you, Grant. Yep. So recommendations for leveraging funds. Uh, where to go for advice about other funding sources. Start local. Is there anyone within your community, either your, your state, your, your county, your city, um, who's worked with the proposed funding source? Who's got experience, recent experience? Contact the funder directly. Um, with HUD 108, um, the Office of Financial Management um, is uh, Paul Webster, Corey Schwartz, Seema Thomas, uh, they want to work with you. 
Um, and uh, just talk to the funder um, because you're government um, and we're supposed to work together. Um, search for attorneys, accountants, consultants, or other professionals who have worked on um, the particular funding source that you wanna access. The internet is helpful at times, but it only takes you so far. It's about building a relationship with someone who's completed a deal um, and has expertise in um, the funding sources that gets you to the next step. Uh, benefit from someone else's experience. Okay, so persuading stakeholders. Um, when leadership or other prominent stakeholders are driving the agenda, how can you respond constructively? Um, you know, it, we always go back to building trusting relationships. Uh, be candid with an elective, elected official about what is and what is not realistic given the timing and capacity. Um, we had a TA assignment where the mayor was a former banker and wanted to do a, uh, a loan for like a little 10 or five or $10,000 uh, working capital assistance in the summer of 2020. And I was like, sir, that's a lot of work in the midst of a crisis. You might want to think about a grant. Um, and then down the road, as things stabilize, a loan can make sense. Because um, I candidly said to the mayor, exactly what are we underwriting when the business is about to shut down without your funding? Um, so again, be candid, be deferential, be respectful, uh, but also be realistic. And I think, Jeremy, this is a good time to just address one of those uh, earlier questions that we said we'd address when it was appropriate later. Um, the question was, they understand the concept of financial feasibility, but you're losing businesses because of COVID impacts on the economy. Banks aren't going to serve businesses in disadvantaged communities that are even riskier due to COVID. So where do we draw the line? That's exactly right. I'm with you. So it may be that you need to target your resources, which even though it seems like we're swimming in them, are limited to the areas that are most impacted and most in need and where you can be the most aggressive, but you're also maybe the most assured of achieving low mod national objectives and outcomes, which is a big portion of what your money needs to do. So um, I would say, where do you draw the line? It's part of that conversation with your stakeholders. What resources already exist on the ground? Where do you not want to duplicate efforts or benefits, right? Um, where is there a program that would have worked uh, six months ago that kind of got mothballed because the crisis seemed to be slowing down and now is worth looking at again? You've, it's work your network and look at what's already available and be a critical thinker, be a critical problem solver. Um, if the banks are being really conservative, how can you be more flexible or how can you support them to take on more risk? You know, we've seen a lot of uh, mortgage lending done where your sources provide backstop and assurance for a bank to use a lower credit score. It could be similar with your businesses. So um, I don't have a, a one size fits all answer because it's a pretty general question, but it's a good concern to have. And so that's how you're gonna approach that. So let me try to add to what Grant said there. Um, some of this is the size of the dollar amount um, that we're, we're talking about. Um, anything under 25,000, if it's to address an immediate need, um, you, know, you might wanna consider a grant with CDBG and then work with the business to develop um, a, a recovery plan uh, of the business. And literally part of the technical assistance with the business is, you know, what do you do after this 25,000 is spent? Um, will you get enough income uh, to cover your expenses and, and grow? Or will you need another infusion of, of capital? At that point, would graduation be, you know, a $50,000 credit line with a bank? revolving credit line. Um, there, CDBG could guarantee a loan pool that a CDFI would use, as an example. Um, or um, you put money uh, into that just to reduce the risk. So it's about the context that we're looking at. 
And the beauty of CDBG is that you can provide assistance to businesses that might have issues with credit, um, might not, uh, what was the word? Um, not necessarily be tra 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 traditional credit worthy. Credit worthy, but they're bankable. Right. Um, and that means there's a there there. It reminds me of my Uncle Bud, Grant. <laughs> Uncle Bud used to sell dry cleaning equipment um, to dry cleaners and laundry machines to, you know, the coin operated laundry. And when I was a lender at Core States a, a very long time ago, he was working with a, a, an operator who had a chance to buy a business in a low mod community. I wanted to do the, the loan. And I said, how's the credit of the operator? And Uncle Bud paused and he said, Jeremy, their credit is terrible, but they're going to make the payment on time. What can I tell you? And you may scratch your head and say, what? But Uncle Bud knew the business and the business operator. And these businesses paid their rent. They paid their suppliers. Now, maybe they also, you know, did retail therapy on their own or something else happened. But in terms of running the business, um, if you dig a little deeper or use the old term, um, uh, create a thicker file, you can see that there's a there there with the business and that's part of the role of subsidy. And the underwriting term there is compensating factors. You just have to dig deeper in the underwriting. All right, for the sake of time, let's keep moving. Leverage with intention, uh, identify where the funding sources are similar, work to create efficiencies, um, determine where the funding sources are different and make sure you're set up to comply with the most restrictive funding source. That's a biggie. Be honest about whether a potential leverage source is a good fit. CDBG CV funds are flexible, but ultimately you've got the compliance obligation of national objective tieback and also the public benefit standard, as well as all the cross-cutting uh, regulations as well. Be realistic about what you need. Uh, if you want to go after additional funding, but have never worked with that funding source before, um, who can help you um, so that there's a transfer of the knowledge? Um, we covered duplication of benefit. Uh, leverage is not the same as duplication of benefits. If there is a funding gap, the benefits are not being duplicated. If they are uh, for the same purpose, then they, they are. Well, even if they're for the same purpose, but at a different point in time is really right. the message there. Sorry, I misread that. My bad. Thank you, Grant. Um, a project budget showing all sources and uses of funding is often the best way to show there is no duplication of benefits. It's really arithmetic. Supplanting is closely related to duplication of benefit. Make sure federal funds are not replacing a local funding uh, commitment. Aim to supplement not to supplant. So there's there's a couple, those are, that's a pretty powerful slide. It's, it's really saying that leveraging is not duplicating. It's layered financing as long as there's a remaining gap or the gap changes at different points in time and the resource availability changes at different points in time. Um, use a, a, a basic sources and uses spreadsheet to show that something is not a gap and that it is a layered resource of funds. And then also be aware of not just duplicating benefits, but supplanting. So if you have a, um, an existing loan product that has been funded by a local authority and they've committed dollars to it, and now you're gonna, re you're gonna redo that program with your CDBG funds because you think you can do it um, better, make sure that they're not considered supplanting or replacing just a loss of revenue. Uh, well, not a loss of revenue, but you're swapping out a general uh, commitment that the local government's already made. So you just have to be careful that if you say, oh yeah, you know, this county is providing a, a, a $10,000 grant and they committed unrestricted subsidy for that, let's just put our CDBG CV in there. Well, if in, in the public hearings and the public budget, that funding's been committed. You need to use up that funding or you need to show that the funding that was 
anticipated to fund that is no longer available because of lost revenues due to COVID, then you're not supplanting, but you gotta be careful about it. Thank you, Grant. Okay, so there's some wonderful economic development resources. First and foremost, the HUD CDBGCV Economic Development Quick Guide. Say that five times fast. We yeah, wrote we don't, it. Yeah. We wrote it, and uh, it was a pleasure to do that. Our goal was to demystify the reg and present some opportunities. We're very proud of the Quick Guide. Um, and of course, you've got the Economic Development Toolkit, Microenterprise. Um, and uh, 24 CFR 570, the heart and soul of CDBG. Um, and, you know, <laughs> a lot of wonderful resources at HUD for you to avail yourselves. Um, and then we have the general resources. Um, and let me just say, Jeremy, these are all going to be um, copied and pasted into the chat as well, so that if anybody needs to take them or check them out now, they can access them. They will be on the slides once you do get the slide presentation and they will be in the recording that as we mentioned before, the unedited recording will be available a few hours through the website for the conference. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, you might have some questions or you might have uh, want some help. The ask a question function is still operational for CDBGCV. In addition, you can ask for on-call technical assistance where maybe you only need up to 16 hours of just consultation. Um, and then there are other situations where maybe you wanna put a program together and you need some direct TA. Um, work with your CPD rep to figure out what you need um, and apply for technical assistance. Um, uh, HUD's made a huge investment in building a, um, a cohort of talented TA providers um, that can work with you. Um, and these are uh, challenging times. Uh, we encourage you to be brave, bold, and persistent as you help your communities prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Um, I'm Jeremy Newberg, and you have my contact information. And I wanna thank Grant for coming in, uh, working with me on this presentation. We hope you found it informative. And if you have additional questions, we are here to help. All right. So I don't see anything on the q and I think we were able to address most of them as we went, um, which was part of our goal. So thank you for some very thoughtful and in the weeds uh, and insightful questions. Uh, if you don't feel that they were uh, sufficiently answered, please, as Jeremy pointed out, you can continue to use the ask a question function uh, through the HUD exchange and um, always consult with uh, your HUD technical assistants or HUD field office representatives. So I hope we were able to give you enough information to be useful or to ask the question in a new way. Um, All right. Thank you for your participation in this conference and uh, we, we wish you the very best of success going forward. Take care. Jeremy, uh, I don't know what happened to Holly, but if you can, um, in your PowerPoint presentation, just copy those links and post them into the chat before we sign off. Then they'll be I'm here. I'm posting them now. Okay. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Be well.